subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon so that you know when live we go. Before we proceed for today's session, there are two very important announcements for you. One is regarding the optional subject. Rao's IAS is conducting the orientation session for optional papers. All of you do understand the importance of optional in civil service examination. It is the most important segment both for your mains exam and also for the interview. So you have to A. Select the right optional for you according to your interest and your aptitude and B. Get the best guidance for the optional subject that you have chosen. Rao's IAS is conducting the orientation session from 24th to 27th May. So if you have not chosen the optional yet, you can come and attend the orientation session for different optional paper and get insight into the syllabus and the subject details. If you already have selected your optional subject, then you come to get insight into the syllabus and as to how to go about preparing the subject. We invite you to come for the orientation class if you're planning to take history as your optional paper or political science and international relation or economics or public administration or psychology or sociology or geography or the increasingly becoming more popular anthropology. You are invited to come for the orientation class in the new building of Rao's IAS at Old Rajender Nagar. Please register online at www.raois.com. Optional paper is make or break for your mains examination. If you are at the initial stage of your preparation, make sure that you make to the orientation class. You can join the session online or you are most welcome in the new building of Rao's IAS in the old Rajendra Nagar. The other announcement for you is concerning the pre prediction for the coming prelims examination. The fourth mock which is free to attempt will be made live on 27th May. You can take the test till 29th May. Result will be published on 30th of May. Take this as the final test before your prelims examination as a warm up and also to stimulate and prepare yourself for the D-Day. You can register for the test on the eLearn platform at the given URL. There is an explain article in the newspaper this week. A look at the legacy of Raja Ramo Hanroy, the father of modern Indian Rinasa. You know the modern Indian historian Ramachandra Guha. He has written in his book Makers of Modern India where he discusses the contribution of various men and women in forming the modern republic. He writes, Roy was unquestionably the first person in the subcontinent to seriously engage with the challenges posed by modernity to traditional social structures and ways of being. He was also the first Indian whose thought and practice were not circumscribed by the constraint of kin, caste and religion. Raja Ramohan Roy really had a beautiful mind. He was simultaneously interested in religion, politics, law, commerce, agrarian enterprise, constitution, administrative reform, civic rights, press freedom. He himself was a avid writer. He gave up his job of Diwan to take up the cause of just treatment of women and upliftment of Indian poor. He was given the title of Raja from the titular king of India, Emperor Akbar II. From the perspective of civil service examination, let's discuss some of the contribution of Raja Ramohan Roy. First of all, for the prelims examination, you must remember that very early on, he published a book called as Tofatul Muahideen. Translated into English, it means a gift to deists. Deists are people who believe in God purely based on rationality and not because of myth and the miraculous stories written in scriptures or heard otherwise. Raja Ramohan Roy was born in 1772 and he published this book in 1803. In 1814, he started Atmiya Sabha, meaning Society of Friends. The purpose was to nurture the age-old tradition of India of philosophical discussions, but channelized towards monotheism as described in Vedanta. The idea was that this ideological discussion will pave the way, the enthusiasm and dedication for campaign against idol worship, casteism, child marriage and other social ills, especially Sati. The organizational work done in the Atmiya Sabha will give way for Brahmo Sabha. Raja Ramohan Roy founded Brahmo Sabha in 1828. Remember this year? 
along with Dabendranath Tagore, the father of Rabindranath Tagore. This Brahmo Sabha was later renamed as Brahmo Samaj. In 1817, Raja Ramohan Roy collaborated with a Scottish philanthropist, David Hare, to set up the Hindu College, which is now called as Presidency University. This was followed up by Anglo Indian School in 1822. These facts are very important for your preliminary stage. In 1825, he established Vedanta College. Vedanta College was a novel concept conceived by Raja Ramohan Roy, where both Indian learning and Western social and political sciences were offered. So his Vedanta College started teaching the philosophy of Will Dyer and also mechanics, which was quite a new course at that time. The legacy of Raja Ramohan Roy perhaps is best known for abolition of sati. Due to the effort of social reformers like Raja Ramohan Roy and other contemporaries like Ishwar Chandra Vidya Sagar, led to the abolition of the cruel practice of sati. It was done during the time of Governor Generalship of Lord William Bentick in 1829. Raja Ramohan Roy characterized sati as violation of every humane and social feeling. and as symptomatic of the moral debasement of a race this is the lowest a race can stoop down to to burn a woman alive in the year 1830 raja ramohan roy traveled to britain he made sure that he would be personally present when the matter would be debated in the british parliament he would do all the rebuttal to make sure that there is no attempt to undo this act of 1829 abolishing sati Apart from Sati, Raja Ramohan Roy and his Brahmo Samaj did extensive campaign against child marriage, illiteracy of women, and the degraded status of widows. And for this, Raja Ramohan Roy understood that it's important to have inheritance and property rights for women. Brahmo Samaj, as now you already know, was established by Raja Ramohan Roy and other leaders in 1828. Initially, it was called as Brahmo Sabha, later rechristened as Brahmo Samaj. Brahmo Samaj carries the legacy to be the first intellectual reform movement in modern India. It is said to dawn the renaissance in modern India. It led to emergence of rational thinking. It enlightened modern India and it had indirect effect extensive in the Indian national movement. But after the death of Raja Ramohan Roy in 1833, things didn't quite go very well for Brahmo Samaj and finally in 1866 it split it into two faction. One of the faction called as Brahmo Samaj of India led by Keshav Chandra Sen and the other was called as Adi Brahmo Samaj that was led by Devendranath Tagore. The split happened fundamentally on the ground of revolutionary thinking of Keshav Chandra Sen. Keshav Chandra Sen considered all religion to be equal and he wanted the teaching of other religions to be brought under Brahmo Samaj. So he wanted the extensive ideas from Christianity to be incorporated. and this mixing of all religion basically became the precipitating point for the split but all factions of brahmo samaj even today they believe in monotheism the chief aim of brahmo samaj is to encourage the worship of one and eternal god the tradition of brahmo samaj is against any kind of ritual any kind of miracles and miraculous stories it is against priesthood and sacrifices the focus is on prayers direct communication with the god meditation and having a closer reading and correct interpretation of the scriptures the idea is of one god and hence unity of all religions but we have as just discussed in 1866 this was the fundamental reason why there was a split in brahmo samaj there is unity of all religion but the idea of taking the teaching from the scriptures of different religion led to the split raja ramohan roy as now you understand was a bulwark of intellectual work he was not just a socio economic reformer he was very well versed in various languages his area of interest was varied he already worked as a personal diwan to higher government officials so he also had a very broad economic and political ideas for reform raja ramohan roy worked intensively for civil liberties and for this he was very impressed by the british system of constitutional government which guarantees civil liberties to people freedom of press was one basic component of civil liberties and when the press censorship was relaxed during the time of lord hasting he is not lord warren hasting the tenure of lord warren hasting ended at 1785 there was a long tenure tenure of lord hasting ending in 1723 and his tenure was marked by war and interventions but press censorship was relaxed to a certain degree during the time of lord hasting in 1819 Raja Ramohan Roy founded remember for the purpose of prelims examination three journals Brahmanical magazine 
in 1821, even if you don't remember the year, remember the name. Samvad Kaumudi, extremely important, and Miratul Akbar, it was a Persian weekly. Raja Ramon Roy was very well versed in Bengali, Sanskrit, Persian, Arabic, and other languages, including English. Raja Ramon Roy also demanded fixation of minimum rents. He also called for the reduction of export duties. And he was very vocal for abolition of East India Company's trading rights, which ultimately will be done. Tell me when. Raja Ramohan Roy also demanded for Indianization of superior services and separation of executive from judiciary. This idea is inscribed in DPSP. Which article? You must take a cursory look at the list of literary work of Raja Ramohan Roy. We have seen Tafatul Muahideen, Vedanta Gantha, translation of an abridgment of Vedanta Sara. He had literary work on Mundaka Upanishad, Kino Upanishad, Isho Upanishad, Katho Upanishad. He extensively wrote on Vedantas and Upanishads. He also wrote a conference between the advocate for and an opponent of practice of burning widows alive. Remember, he also wrote a defense of Hindu theism, the prospect of Jesus, the guide to peace and happiness. He wrote the Bengali grammar, the universal religion, history of Indian philosophy, and Gaudiya Vyakran. If you just read once, the names will automatically clinch in your mind. For the purpose of your ethics paper, you can use Raja Ramohan Roy's example in various contexts. For example, you must know that Raja Ramohan Roy was born into a prosperous upper caste Brahmin family and he grew with these orthodox caste practices around him. He saw child marriage, polygamy and dowry to be very prevalent. As a matter of fact, he himself was married more than once in his childhood. But he still stood against the practices so widely and deeply embedded in his culture that was part of his way of life, that were practiced by his elders that he revered. This is an example of integrity. This can also be an example of courage of conviction. You must also know that Raja Ramon Roy's sister-in-law, she became victim of Sati after his elder brother died. And it is said that this was the instant that moved him and changed him forever. When you study attitude, you are taught that there are three components of attitude. In the CAB model, you study that there is a cognitive component, there is an affectionate component, and there is a behavioral component. In the cognitive component, basically it's the ideas, it's the knowledge, experience that helps in developing the attitude of a person. We have seen previously that Raja Ramo and Roy started studying various religious scriptures and writing on them very early on. This must have been developing his cognitive attitude towards Sati and towards socio-religious practices in general. The knowledge that he was gathering, the ideas that he was developing. But to develop very strong attitude, all the components of attitude must be developed. The affectionate component is related with emotion. And when he saw his sister-in-law getting burned alive, that must have induced very strong emotion in him. And then he made it a purpose of his life to abolish this ill from the society. Whosoever has developed very strong attitude against any ill, any socially undesirable practices, had very strongly developed affectionate component apart from the cognitive component. If you look at the life of Gandhiji, Gandhiji made it a mission to fight against the oppressors and make India a free land after he was thrown out of the train and he spent that cold chilling night on the platform. Huge amount of emotion was running through him but he channelized it positively. He saw the suffering of people very closely in South Africa first and later back at home. So this is how the affectionate component is developed and which is required apart from cognitive component, apart from all the knowledge that you have gathered. Emotion is essential to develop attitude for you to go through difficult times to have that courage of conviction. Raja Ramohan Roy was very confident and strength of his own heritage. He was proud and confident of Indian philosophy and the teachings in Vedantas and scriptures. It was only the matter of correct interpretation of these scriptures. Because of the confidence, he was not shying away from incorporating the components from other scriptures and other ideas. He truly laid the foundation for unity in diversity and the mutual coexistence. There's a topic in your syllabus called as persuasion. There are many techniques of persuasion that is being taught to you as to how to change the attitude of people or a group of people or society in general. In your history text, you study about Raja Ramohan Roy, how he changed the thinking, the mindset against Sati and got the law passed against it. In the same history textbook, you would also study about Young Bengal Movement. Young Bengal Movement 
also had the similar idea as Raja Ramohan Roy. But they also didn't want the society to be reeling under the socio-religious ills. But Young Bengal movement could not achieve anything. It was very soon dissolved. It could not sustain their idea and the movement could not be carried forward. You know the reason? The reason is the technique of persuasion of Young Bengal movement was not right. They used to denigrate the followers of those rituals and worse, the scripture itself. But Raja Ramohan Roy was confident of his heritage, was confident of the teaching of Vedanta. And as we have just discussed, attitude has very strong connection with emotion. And you want to change the attitude, you want to develop the emotion rather than destroy the emotion. And if people are emotionally linked with something, and if you disturb the emotion or hurt the feeling, then actually it is not helping the cause of reform. It will make the situation even worse. Raja Ramohan Roy actually restored or even strengthened the confidence in the religious scriptures. But he just called for the correct interpretation of those scriptures. This is why he was successful and Young Bengal movement was not. There is an explained article discussing why textile and garment industries want ban on cotton exports. An account of reduction in production because of the prevailing heat waves. So on the parallel ground, the textile and garment industries want ban on cotton exports as well. The reason is pretty simple. The cost of the cotton yarn has grown by about 100% in last one year. The reason why as to cotton prices has soared so much is because of lower production. Production has declined by around 10% this year compared to last year. International price also has increased and hence export has become more attractive. Additionally, the domestic demand for cotton yarn has increased significantly. It has been observed that during pandemic, the demand for bed sheets, towels and other fabrics have zoomed. So the consumption for cotton yarn has increased. Because of these factors, the prices have soared. But then a big question remains as to why production has decreased of cotton yarn. Reason number one for decrease in production is the decrease in net sown area. The crop area for cotton has been continuously decreasing from around 134.77 lakh hectare in 2019-20 to 133 lakh hectare in 2020-21, in decreasing to around 124 lakh hectare in 2021-22. And why the area under cotton cover is decreasing is largely because of diminishing benefits coming from the genetically modified BT cotton. BT cotton tripled the production of cotton of India and that's how India was able to become the largest cotton producer in the world, surpassing China. The production increased from about 136 lakh bale to 398 lakh bale between 2002-03 and 2013-14. Now you must also understand why over the period of time, BT cotton starts giving reduced return. It has been observed that BT cotton has become increasingly more susceptible to pink ballworm and white fly insect pest attacks. For the purpose of your prelims exam, you must also remember that pink ballworm pest is related with cotton crop. And the cotton crop also gets affected by unseasonal rains in November, December. And this affects the quality and quantity of balls for the second and third flushes. You see, cotton harvest is done in multiple pickings. The first picking is done in October, November and subsequent pickings are done in the interval of 15 to 30 days. Untimely rainfall in November, December, which has been increasingly observed, that affects the second and third pickings. So these factors have amounted for decreased cotton production in our country. So should we ban the cotton export? See, banning anything is never a good idea in a liberalized, globalized world. Until and unless it is extremely necessary for food crops, for example, rice and wheat. Firstly, the export of cotton already has decreased to around 40 lakh bale, down from 78 lakh bale in 2020-21. And especially when center has removed the import duty, it was 11%, now it is nil. When the import duty on cotton has been removed, it doesn't make much sense to not allow the export. And anyways, the domestic prices has already risen to the international level. So naturally, the exports will now slow down. Banning a crop always sends a negative signal for the next plantation season, which is just around the corner in the next month with the arrival of southwest monsoon. But on the other hand, the argument also is that the farmers already have sold their crops, 
So now at this stage, if we ban the export, it is not going to hurt farmers. But nevertheless, it's going to hurt the industrial supply chain. For the purpose of prelims examination, you must also be aware of certain basic facts regarding cotton crop. First of all, it's extremely useful cash crop, giving us fiber, oil, and protein. Cotton crop alone meets around 27% of world's textile need. You must also know that India is the largest producer of cotton. India was the second largest producer of cotton after China, but India superseded China in 2019. And ever since India is the largest producer of cotton, it accounts for around 23% of world's cotton. India is the third largest exporter of cotton after US and Brazil. And India is the largest consumer of cotton. India also imports cotton. But you must remember that the productivity of cotton is very, very low. It is around just one third of the major cotton producing countries. So India does manage to become the largest producer by having extremely large area under the cotton production. For the production, cotton requires temperature range of 21 to 30 degrees Celsius, rainfall around 50 to 100 centimeter. So even in semi-arid region, cotton can be grown. The soil type required for cotton is well-drained black cotton soil, mostly found in the Deccan Plateau. In India, Gujarat followed by Maharashtra and Telangana, they are the largest producers. Cotton mostly is grown either in the hybrid form or the latest BT cotton that has become more popular was introduced in India in 2002. But hybrid cotton is under cultivation since 1970. In hybrid cotton, cross-pollination of two parent strains having different genetic characteristics is done. But in BT cotton, as you would know, genetically modified pest resistant variety of bacteria is used that enhances the capability of a cotton crop to fight the pest. This is an explained article on polio. It says Mozambique confirms first wild polio virus case in 30 years. What is it? How is it transmitted? Previously, you must be reading in the news that the wild polio virus for the first time was detected in Malawi. And now since it has been confirmed in Mozambique, the concern is now again being raised on this powerful virus spreading far and wide from the place it was first detected. So let's have a comprehensive discussion on polio virus. Africa has been declared polio free or to say polio has been eradicated in the region. For a country or a region to be declared polio free, the wild transmission of all three kinds of polio virus has to be stopped. It is not just the case of wild virus, but also vaccine derived polio infection must also come to zero. We will discuss in a short while what vaccine derived viruses are. Wild viruses are the one that naturally gives infection and they are present in nature naturally. You must also be aware of the difference between eradication and elimination. Eradication of a disease refers to complete and permanent worldwide reduction to zero new cases. So if a disease has been eradicated, no further control measures are required. However, elimination of a disease refers to reduction to zero or a very low defined target rate of new cases. And this very low number of target cases can be defined by the concerned organization for any specific geographical area. So elimination of a disease will still require continued measures to prevent the re-establishment of disease. You must be aware that India received polio-free certification from WHO back in 2014. The last case registered in India was in 2011. Presently, only Afghanistan and Pakistan are the countries where the polio infection cases still keep coming up. Polio is supposed to have been eradicated from the rest of the world. If you talk about the polio virus, it is a positive sense, single-stranded RNA virus. There are three serotypes of wild polio virus. They have been named as type 1, type 2 and type 3. There are slight variation in the outer caspid protein of these viruses. And because of that variation, you would understand by your knowledge of the outer layer of the coronavirus and the spike protein, immunity to one serotype does not confer immunity to the other two. But presently, only type 1 polio virus remains. Type 2 was eradicated in 2015 and type 3 was declared eradicated in 2019. The polio virus can show various symptoms and infect a human being in various ways. If the infection is in the central nervous system, then there will be paralysis. And this paralysis is irreversible. It cannot be treated. 
but infection of poliovirus can also be outside the central nervous system and in those cases there are minor illness with mild symptoms so poliovirus not necessarily will lead to paralysis actually less than 1% of poliovirus infection results in paralysis the most common route for the spread of poliovirus is through the fecal oral route when infected individuals they excrete into the open the virus sneaks into the environment and if the hygiene condition is not good it rapidly spreads throughout the community through the water the food intake polio virus affects mostly children under 5 years of age where immune system is not very robust once infection has happened it can not be cured so prevention is the only cure you must know that polio virus enters through the mouth and multiplies in the intestine the present outbreak that has happened in some region of africa also in some region of southeast asia that is supposed to be happening because of circulating vaccine derived polio virus while circulating vaccine derived polio virus are rare they have been increasing in recent years due to low immunization rates within countries and within different region in a country african region was declared to have eradicated polio virus The region was declared to have interrupted transmission of wild polio virus in 2020. So the only way the polio virus is affecting the region is either the virus is coming from outside the region from Pakistan or Afghanistan or the current infections are because of circulating vaccine derived polio virus. The oral polio vaccine that we will discuss very shortly, oral polio vaccine, they have brought the wild polio virus to the brink of eradication. and they have had many benefits about which we will talk in a short while but oral polio vaccines they are live attenuated vaccine because they are live attenuated they provide better immunity in the gut and we have just seen that the polio virus multiplies in the intestine so better immunity in the gut helps fighting the virus better but the thing is that since it is live attenuated so the live virus can actually be excreted and where the sanitary conditions are poor the live virus coming out of stool of the infected person can spread from people to people and this can actually bring passive immunity and protect the community however in communities with low immunization rates the virus is spread from one unvaccinated child to other over a long period of time and when the immunization rates are low that means the virus can multiply in the guts and when multiplication happens mutation will inevitably happen and through mutation it can take a form that can cause paralysis just like the wild polio virus this mutated polio virus can then spread in communities leading to circulating vaccine derived polio viruses hence the cause of circulating vaccine derived polio virus is low immunization rate so the best way to prevent them and to stop them when there is a disease outbreak is to vaccinate children the polio vaccine protects children whether the kind of polio is wild polio virus or vaccine derived polio virus outbreaks are usually rapidly stopped with 2 to 3 rounds of high quality supplementary immunization activities so let's talk about vaccines there are two kinds of vaccines available for polio the most predominant vaccine in use is oral polio vaccine There are different types of oral polio vaccine and they may contain one or a combination of two or all three different types of or all three serotypes of attenuated vaccine. Attenuated vaccine as you understand contain live virus but they have been deactivated either because of heating or irradiation or some chemical stress or, or through any other form but they have been made less effective but still they are live so they are able to replicate effectively in the intestine. but they are around 10000 times less able to enter the central nervous system their infectivity is attenuated this enables the individuals to mount an immune response against the virus very powerfully live attenuated vaccines gives the highest amount of immunity so all countries that have eradicated polio have used oral polio vaccine because it is easy to administer it is easy to handle it does not require specialized medical professionals it does not require injections and syringe and inherently it is inexpensive it is very effective because the immune response is strongest in case of live attenuated vaccine it is also safe it is safe because oral polio vaccine stimulates good mucosal immunity and this is why it is so effective in interrupting the transmission of the virus 
the mucosal immunity increases and vaccinated children their guts won't allow the multiplication of virus so their chances of they leaking out through the stool will also be less and hence the risk of community spread will also be less it is administered orally so it does not require highly skilled health professionals it does not require sterile needle or syringes they are easy to administer and hence they are helpful in mass vaccination campaigns also for several weeks after vaccination the vaccine virus replicates in the intestine and they can be excreted and can be spread to others in close contact this means that in areas with poor hygiene and sanitation immunization with oral polio vaccine can result in passive immunization of people who have not been vaccinated but as i have told you before everything has a cost high effectiveness comes with slight compromise on safety oral polio vaccine they are considered to be extremely safe and effective in extreme rare cases at the rate of approximately 2 to 4 events in 1 million birth the live attenuated vaccine virus in oral polio vaccine can cause paralysis in some cases it is believed that it may be triggered by an immunodeficiency also very rarely though but when there is insufficient coverage of vaccine in the community the vaccine virus may be able to circulate and then mutate and then over the course of 12 to 18 months reacquire the ability to get into the central nervous system this is what we have discussed in the circulating vaccine derived polio virus this may cause the reappearance of the disease outbreak the other kind of vaccine is inactivated polio virus vaccine inactivated means killed form of virus the virus is not alive so virus will not multiply this may also have strains of all three polio virus types it is given in the form of injection intramuscular or intradermal injection so of course it will require a little more trained health workers inactivated polio virus vaccine produces antibodies in the blood they do not orally go into the intestine of the gut they go into the blood streams so they create antibodies in the blood and in the event of infection these antibodies prevent the spread of the virus from getting inside the central nervous system because in case of inactivated polio virus vaccine the virus is not live so there is no risk of vaccine associated paralytic polio i told you that live attenuated vaccine they cause highest amount of immune response but also inactivated virus vaccines they also trigger an excellent protective immune response in most people so the effectiveness could be slightly less but it is very very safe there hasn't been any serious adverse reaction that has been shown anywhere in the world following the vaccination of polio in the form of inactivated polio virus vaccine so ipv is also highly effective in preventing paralytic disease but the thing is that ipv goes into the blood stream so they induce very low level of immunity in the intestine as a result when a person immunized with ipv is infected with wild polio virus the virus can still multiply inside the intestine and be shed into the environment through the fecal material raising the risk of continued circulation also it is more expensive than opv administration of ipv will require trained health workers as well as the sterile injection equipments and the procedures have to be laid down clearly see an increasing number of industrialized polio free countries they are using ipv now ipv is the vaccine of choice this is because the risk of paralytic polio associated with continued routine use of opv is deemed greater than the risk of imported wild virus so circulating vaccine derived polio virus if this has to be avoided then ipv must be used however as ipv does not stop transmission of the virus opv is used wherever a polio outbreak needs to be contained even in countries which rely exclusively on ipv for their routine immunization program but once polio has been eradicated use of all opv will need to be stopped to prevent reestablishment of transmission due to vaccine derived polio viruses this explained article discusses the changes that has happened in the telecommunication sector from 1g to 5g the g in 5g stand for generation meaning it is the fifth generation technology in any area whenever you have a technological breakthrough or you have a technological revolution then that is called as a next generation technology 
we are calling it 5g technology meaning in this area of telecommunication fifth time this is a technological breakthrough fifth time te telecommunication revolution has happened when it happened for the first time we called it 1g 1g meaning this telecommunication began and it was a analog technology you remember those phones in which gol 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 karke ghumate the that was the analog system that telecommunication that was the first way of beginning to telecommunicate that was 1g and it supported only voice the speed you will be amazed to know will be was, was only 2.4 kbps 2.4 kbps but still it was for the first time you can listen to the voice of a distant person it was a technological breakthrough that was 1g after that we had came into the era of 2g when we came close to 2000 it was in 1980s 90s in 2g it was there was a considerable improvement over 1g now the system has become digital first of all it is no more analog and now you can send data apart from voice remember those smaller phones in early 2000 where you used to send you might you, you, you might be too young but you might remember you used to send sms and mms and some kind of picture messages this kind of communication was allowed by those gadget so data communication was also there apart from voice communication and the speed was increased considerably from 2.4 kbps to 64 kbps so from voice you have come to data plus voice again it was a technological breakthrough then <coughs> came the time of 3g in 3g the speed was much more much more from 64 kbps the maximum speed that one can enjoy in 3g is 2 mbps so speed has increased considerably mobile internet access was also possible and this was very crucial in 2g you did not have the internet access you couldn't send some sms write some message and send but internet operability was not there on the phone internet operability came for the first time in 3g speed was more internet operability was more you can send more data and you could also do because of internet access video calling so again in the field of telecommunication you had a technological breakthrough and you came to a next level next generation 3g there was a connecting link between 3g and 4g do you know what is that do you remember those cdma phones gprs yeah that was the link between 3g and 4g when the era of 4g came the speed increased substantially very high speed and the cost of the mobile phone data packet transfer was also decreased from 3g to 4g when we went the services were almost the same that you enjoyed in 3g except for very high speed but when you came from 3g to 4g but then there was improvement further the speed was further increased by reliance reliance took this initiative of having 4g lte lte stand for long term evolution and when lte service came in 4g then the speed drastically increased it came somewhere between 100 mbps to 1 gbps and now you can see videos without buffering very high resolution which was not possible in 3g then when reliance launched jio in reliance jio you had another service called as volte v o l t e meaning voice over lte in lte what used to happen when if you if you are on call if you are using the voice service then your internet service will not work in 4g internet service went back to 3g in 4g lte but in voice over lte voice, as the name suggests voice over lte meaning even though you are having voice service your lte service will still work so you will be still connected to 4g you can talk to someone and still use your internet 4g internet that is volte voice over long term evolution upsc in 2019 has asked this simple question with reference to communication technologies what is are the difference between lte and volte they said that lte is commonly marked as 3g no we know that lte was brought about as part of 4g lte is data only service which is true 
and VOLT is <coughs> voice only service, which is not true. It is voice over, not voice only. VOLT is voice. You can have use the voice service. You can also use LTE service, and you can use simultaneously. LTE is data only service, which is again false. I mean, LTE is both voice all service and data service. But the thing is, in LTE, you cannot do it directly. Sorry, simultaneously. In VOLT, you could do it simultaneously. But to say that VOLT is voice only is incorrect. It is voice plus data, and both can be so both can be accessed simultaneously. So both the statement was wrong in this question. That is about 4G. Now we are interested to know what is 5G. There is considerable change. When you went from 3G to 4G, your infrastructure was not to be changed. Same tower, same kind of receptor, same kind of emitter, same antennas, everything worked out well. You just have to change the spectrum in which you are working. You have a higher spectrum and you easily transmitted, you easily transferred, trans migrated from 3G to 4G. But from here, 4G to 5G, the step is not easy. It is not easy. In 5G, the whole infrastructure will change. You'll have to add too much into the present infrastructure to migrate from 4G to 5G. See, what you will have in 5G, first of all, there will be ultra low latency. This is very important, very, very important. This is one of the most important thing about 5G service. Latency will be negligible, negligible in millisecond. Latency is the time that a network takes to respond. See, I'm going to tell you very important thing. Now focus here. In 5G, there is certain improvement from 4G. The improvement, the most important improvement is ultra low latency. Latency is the time that the network takes to respond. For example, if you open up your mobile phone, if you are on 4G network, and definitely in India, you'll be in 4G network here. If you open a site, it won't open immediately. In the, in the Jiffy, in that instant, when you click on the URL, enter, it doesn't splash. It takes some time. Sometimes you see the message popping up, connecting to google.com or, or securing the connection or looking for secure connection, whatever, some kind of messaging will be there. And it's one second or so it will take to open up the site. That is latency. That is a time lag. That is a time lag that the network takes to respond. You have commanded the network to open something and the time that the network takes to adhere to your command that is latency. Latency in 4G is high, considerable, one to three seconds. It may take even more to open up a site. That is latency and that is high, that is high. In 5G, the latency will be in milliseconds. So there will be ultra low latency and there will be implication of this low latency. We'll talk about in a, time, in, a, in, a in a moment, but I'm just giving you the features, characteristics, what you will get in 5G. Latency will be low. Secondly, the connection density could be high. Presently in the hotspot of 4G, if 10 people gets connected, it will burn out. The speed will be ultra slow. But that kind of problem will not be there in 5G. In a 5G hotspot, more than 10 people, 20 people can easily get connected. Thirdly, the stable network will be provided by 5G. The coil drops that you have, when you go from one place to another, there is, is, is a change in, in the mobile tower that the phone is connected to even if it is of the same service provider, but there's some changes and you face problem. Thus network is not very stable, but that problem will also not be there in 5G. And all these things apart, 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 apart from very, very high speed, very, very high speed. In 4G, the maximum speed that one can touch is one Gbps. And this is the frequency band. You understand when you get a connection internet, the internet service provider give you the frequency band. 100 Mbps, 200 Mbps, but you always know that that speed is never going to be achieved in your device. That is a frequency band, meaning maximum, maximum anybody can achieve in that bus that the service provider is using is 100 Mbps or 200 Mbps or 1 Gbps. You yourself will not be able to communicate with the network with the speed of 1 Gbps. You will get a fraction of that. But the maximum frequency bandwidth in 4G is 1 Gbps. So far, so far in 5G, the testing has been done till 20 Gbps. And it is, it is said to be increased from here, even more. 
20 Gbps. It is very, very high. The video file that you have, that is of how much? 200 MB, 300 MB. It's of very high resolution will be of 1 GB. It is 20 Gbps per second. Your files will be downloaded like this. A heavy video file will be downloaded in three seconds. You're not going to get 20 Gbps, but you'll get a fraction of this. Even if you get one Gbps, one GB file will be downloaded in a second. So these are the four things you must have to have in your mind. The latency is very low in 5G. The connection density problem will not be there. You can have a dense connection with one hotspot and the speed, speed is very high. The reason why all these things will be possible for 5G is you are using a wide frequency spectrum <coughs> and you will be working on a higher frequency band. There are two frequency band for 5G. Remember, please, one is around six gigahertz. From 450 megahertz, it goes till six gigahertz. India will be using it around 3.3, 3.4 gigahertz. But this frequency band is internationally used for 5G. This is lower frequency band. In the higher range of frequency band, it goes till in the range of 24 gigahertz to around 52 gigahertz. And if you are, if the telecom operator, if the government has given the higher frequency band to the telecom operator, then man, the speed will be very high. It will not just be 20 GBPS, it can go till 50 GBPS.